Rub up your engines! Pissing Christian says, should I repair a blown head gasket or wait? I got an 01 Honda Accord, 3 liter V6, 130,000 miles. Blown head gasket and leaking radiator, but it still isn't overheating. I have to add coolant all the time. I'm planning to buy a vehicle once the market drops. How long will the motor last before it goes? Is it worth waiting? Okay, here's the thing. I was thinking months ago, well, you know, people should wait because the market's got to come down. Well, I kind of changed my opinion on that. I don't think the market's coming down for quite some time. It looks like hyperinflation has taken over. Everything, houses, cars, everything, the price is just spiraling out of control, right? And with the political climate we're in now, with everybody giving everything away, nobody paying for it, that adds more to hyperinflation. So I don't think anytime soon, the price of used cars is going to come down or new cars. I think it's only going to continue to go up. Like I said before, hopefully it won't end up like the Weimar Republic post-World War or one Germany where people were spending a billion Reichmark for a loaf of bread, a whole wheelbarrow full of paper money to get a loaf of bread. I doubt if it'll go that far, but I don't think prices are coming down any time soon. I see houses that are listed for like 600000 that sell for 900000 in a bidding frenzy and just not even that great houses in a great neighborhood. So I see the same thing with cars. If I were you, I'd start looking for a car because if you have a blown head gasket, and that's a V6 Honda, it costs a lot of money to do that correctly. A lot of guys will say, oh, we can do it for 900 bucks, blah, blah, blah. You get it back, it doesn't run right. Half the stuff's broken. To fix an engine correctly costs thousands and thousands of dollars. And it's not going to last that much longer. If the head gasket it is blown. You're losing coolant, but it's not leaking. It's burning it. And if it's burning it, it's going to go out at some point in time. There's no saying. It could burn out tomorrow or it could burn out two months from tomorrow. I don't know. If I were you, I'd start looking for another car and just bite the bullet unless you want to spend thousands and thousands on that Accord. Still wonder, gee, is it really going to be fixed, right? I just start looking now and bite the bullet because I don't think it's going to get any better. It's probably only getting worse in the next year or two or three. At least for the next three years, it's going to be a real stinker ride for a lot of people. If you wait, it's probably only going to get worse because I see prices of everything going up. I don't see anything coming down in the car market from anything I can see, forecast. I don't see anything. Now, you never know. Maybe a relative can't drive anymore or somebody's kid's going to college and they're selling the car. You never know what you're going to find. There's always a deal somewhere if you look hard enough. PP35 says, should I sell? I got a 98 Toyota Senna with 256,000 kilometers, but it used eight years ago for 1,500. Man, you got a deal on that. I think it would last me two to three years, but it lasts for eight years. I stopped driving because of the pandemic. It needs an alignment. And things need fixed. I'm presently driving an 03 Honda CRV with 190,000 kilometers, which has a few problems. Should I fix both these? Buy a new Sienna? What should I do? You know, if I were you, you paid so little for the Sienna. The market's so high. See what you can get for it. If you get good money for it, sell the Sienna and fix the Honda. That's what I'd do if I were you. Because Hondas can run forever and you only got 190,000 kilometers, which is like, what, 100,000 miles or something. They can last a long, long. That's what I'd do if I were you. You obviously don't need two vehicles. I would fix the CRV because when you start pricing newer cars now, you're not going to find a nice Toyota Sienna's for 1500 bucks. You're going to be paying three, four, five times that now. The market's gone insane. Fix the Honda CRV. They can last three, four, five hundred thousand miles and see what you can get for the Sienna. Alan Seven says, should I turn off traction control when I'm driving in the desert? I don't know what desert you're driving and how fast you're going. All right, if you know how to drive, go ahead and turn it off. Now, traction control is to stop accidents, right? How many other people are driving in the desert? <laughs> if you're the only one there, do whatever you want. Just realize that you don't want to get stuck in the sand. But at the same time, if you do have traction control, it might go bananas in the sand because you're going to get so much slippage. And those systems aren't designed for sand. They're designed more for wet roads and maybe snow and ice, but not for driving in the sand. And what are you doing driving out in the sand in the desert anyways? You know? <laughs> But experiment with it when there's no one around and see how you feel. And if you're driving in the sand anyways, my advice, make sure you got shovels and some nice mats in the trunk. You can put mats under the tires, jack it up, and then drive yourself out. You don't want to get stuck in the middle of nowhere, especially if it's high noon and you're going to dehydrate like a prune. <laughs> Mo says, I got a Mazda 6. 2014 with a check engine light on. It's got PO171 and CO301. I cleaned the MAF sensor and it disappeared for a few weeks and it came back. What's the problem? It says it's running lean, but it also has a communication code. Now the communication codes have to deal with the computer, its bus line, where the data goes back and forth between a computer and the sensors and has three different speeds. That is the real clue to what's probably wrong. When you got a communication code, there's something electronic wrong. Now you cleaned it. Yeah, it could have been dirty. It might have helped a little. But communication codes are because of electronic failure somewhere down the line. I would say 
knowing Mazdas, I just buy a mass sensor and put it on, a brand new one, and not one made in China, and an OEM original equipment map sensor. And then you want to pray you don't have a wiring failure or problems in the main computer. If you got an electrical problem, it's either the sensor, the wiring, or the circuits in the computer that drive that particular sensor. Pray it's just the MAF sensor. It normally is, because if it's the wiring or the computer, you're going to need a mechanic to check that. But most of the time, just changing that MAF sensor will fix it. Miss Stickman 25 says, I'm looking for a V6 Camry only. 2015 to 18, and I want a V6. I want to maintain it. I have Nissan now, but I don't want to get with any problems that a car is going to have. All right. Well, I'll give you some actual advice. Those are good year cameras, right? But I wouldn't buy a V6. I'd buy a four. It's got plenty enough horsepower. There's half the moving parts because you got an inline four instead of three three cylinders and a V6. It's a lot more moving parts. You get worse gas mods with the V6. The four cylinders, plenty fast enough. I mean, I rent them all the time when I fly places. Now I try to get a camera. I like them. They're powerful, but they get phenomenal gas mileage. They get such good gas mods that I can drive here from Clarksville to the Nashville airport in a Toyota camera. Camry, and I don't even have to add gas by the time it's an hour drive to Nashville because the gauge stills on full. I like that when I'm renting a car because I hate looking for a gas station when I'm going back to the airport. I personally would go for a four cylinder one. I wouldn't waste the money on a V6. It's a little bit faster, but hey, the four is going to outlast it and they still got plenty of horsepower to it. It's not like you're pulling, you know, 10,000 pounds with the thing in a trailer. You don't use them for that. So I'd look at the four cylinder ones if I were you. Now, GM just unveiled the new electric motors they're going to use for the future future electric vehicles starting with the Hummer and I've already found a problem. Two of these motors are permanent magnet motors. They require magnets. It's a hard supply to tap into. Maybe not such a smart idea. Only the smallest one which is 62 kilowatt hours is an induction motor where it's using the windings to create a magnetic field and not actual magnets. They're big 255 kilowatt hours and they're in between 180 kilowatt hour ones. Use magnets and I can see production problems right there. Now they're not going to make that many of these Hummer EVs. They start, I believe, at over 100 grand, so it's not like they're going to fly off the shelf like hotcakes. Only a certain amount of people are going to be able to afford them and want to buy them. But you know, problems getting the magnets, getting enough of them for production. And they have new controllers that are, say, are 50% less mass and volume, but have 25% more capability. Yeah, put everything smaller, more compact in one part. You know, it's going to break. Where do you find how much money it costs to buy these controllers when they do break? GM does not have the greatest record for electric vehicles. Act like this is revolutionary. I don't think revolutionary at all. They don't have enough of them be like a chip shortage. Oh, we can't get enough magnets, so we can't build these things. Well, one reason I'd say it's not absolute disaster is this. There could be that many people buying electric cars to begin with. They think they're going to sell millions and millions of them. Dream on, if you ask me. There's only so many rare earth magnets around. They're going to cost more and more. Of course, like I say, GM, do you look at the future? Not really. Just like their electric cars that are starting on fire. Oh, well, we didn't build them right. Well, we'll try to fix the modules. Oh, no, it's not the modules. They're still burning down. Oh, now we'll change the battery pack. Not a company I'd buy an electric car from. Now, here's an interesting quote that I got from one of you viewers. How people actually seem to be getting dumber, not smarter. And I quote, if you think you're smarter than the previous generation, 50 years ago, the owner's manual of a car showed you how to adjust the valves on the engine. Today, it just warns you not to drink the contents of the battery. <laughs> and isn't that the truth? I grew up in Niagara Falls. We used to actually swim in the river above the falls. There were parts that really weren't that bad. and We'd swim around in. We know not to go. None of us ever drowned, right? Now they have signs, you know, dangerous, fast running water. The point that in the owner's manual, it's got to tell you not to drink battery acid. Somebody thinks people are getting dumber by the second. And it's true too. Some of the manuals actually say that. That's where he got this information from. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.